Count one charges the defendant with first-degree murder. Arizona law recognizes two types of first-degree murder, premeditated murder and felony murder. The state has charged the defendant with both types. The crime of first-degree premeditated murder requires the state to prove the following. Number one, the defendant caused the death of another person and two, the defendant intended or knew that she would cause the death of another person, and three, the defendant acted with premeditation. Premeditation means that the defendant intended to kill another human being or knew she would kill another human being, and that, after forming that intent or knowledge, reflected on the decision before killing. It is this reflection, regardless of the length of time in which it occurs, that distinguishes first-degree murder from second-degree murder. While reflection is required for first-degree murder, the time needed for reflection is not necessarily prolonged, and the space of time between the intent or knowledge to kill and the act of killing may be very short. An act is not done with premeditation if it is the instant effect of a sudden quarrel or heat of passion. The crime of first degree premeditated murder includes the lesser offense of second degree murder. You may consider a lesser offense if either one, you find the defendant not guilty of first degree premeditated murder or two, after full and careful consideration of the facts, you cannot agree on whether to find the defendant guilty or not guilty of first-degree premeditated murder. You cannot find the defendant guilty of any offense unless you find the state has proved each element of that offense beyond a reasonable doubt. The crime of second-degree murder requires proof of one of the following. One, the defendant intentionally caused the death of another person, or two, the defendant caused the death of another person by conduct which the defendant knew would cause death or serious physical injury, or three, under circumstances manifesting extreme indifference to human life, the defendant recklessly engaged in conduct that created a grave risk of death and thereby caused the death of another person. The risk must be such that disregarding it was a gross deviation from what a reasonable person in the defendant's situation would have done. The difference between first-degree murder and second-degree murder is that second-degree murder does not require premeditation by the defendant. If you determine that the defendant is guilty of either first-degree murder or second-degree murder and you have a reasonable doubt as to which it was, you must find the defendant guilty of second-degree murder. If and only if you find the elements of second-degree murder were proven beyond a reasonable doubt, you must then consider whether the homicide was committed upon a sudden quarrel or heat of passion resulting from adequate provocation by the victim. Adequate provocation means conduct or circumstances sufficient to deprive a reasonable person of self-control. Words alone are not adequate provocation to justify reducing an intentional killing to manslaughter. There must not have been a cooling off period between the provocation and the killing. A cooling off period is the time it would take a reasonable person to regain self-control under the circumstances. If, after finding the elements of second degree murder were proven beyond a reasonable doubt, you also unanimously find beyond a reasonable doubt that the homicide was not committed upon a sudden quarrel or heat of passion resulting from adequate provocation by the victim, then you must find the defendant guilty of second degree murder. If, after finding the elements of second degree murder were proven beyond a reasonable doubt, you also unanimously find beyond a reasonable doubt that the homicide was committed upon a sudden quarrel or heat of passion resulting from adequate provocation by the victim, then you must find the defendant not guilty of second-degree murder, but guilty of manslaughter. If you determine that the defendant is guilty of either second-degree murder or manslaughter, but you have a reasonable doubt as to which it was, you must find the defendant guilty of manslaughter. The defendant cannot be guilty of both second-degree murder and manslaughter.
As stated earlier, count one also charges the defendant with first degree felony murder. The crime of first degree felony murder requires the state to prove the following two things. One, the defendant committed or attempted to commit burglary in the second degree. And two, in the course of and in furtherance of committing burglary in the second degree or immediate flight from it, the defendant caused the death of any person. An attempt requires the state to prove that the defendant intentionally did something which, under the circumstances she believed them to be, was a step in a course of conduct planned to culminate in the commission of the offense. The crime of burglary in the second degree requires proof that the defendant, one, entered or remained unlawfully in or on a residential structure, and two, did so with intent to commit any theft or felony therein. Residential structure means any structure, movable or immovable, permanent or temporary, that is adapted for both human residence and lodging, whether occupied or not. Intentionally or with intent to means with respect to conduct, I'm sorry, with respect to a result or to conduct described by a statute defining an offense, that a person's objective is to cause that result or to engage in that conduct. There are no lesser included offenses for first degree felony murder. In order to find the defendant guilty of count one, it is not necessary that you be unanimous with respect to whether the defendant is guilty of first degree premeditated murder or first degree felony murder. The only requirement is that you be unanimous that the defendant is guilty of first degree murder, which can be either first degree premeditated murder or first degree felony murder. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree murder, you must indicate on the verdict form how many of you have found the defendant guilty of first degree premeditated murder and or first degree felony murder. By way of example only, the jury can be unanimous as to both theories or just one theory or it may be divided. A defendant is justified in using or threatening deadly physical force in self-defense if the following two conditions existed. One, a reasonable person in the situation would have believed that deadly physical force was immediately necessary to protect against another's use or apparent, attempted, or threatened use of unlawful deadly physical force and two, the defendant used or threatened no more deadly physical force than would have appeared necessary to a reasonable person in the situation. A defendant may use deadly physical force in self-defense only to protect against another's use or apparent attempted or threatened use of deadly physical force. Self-defense justifies the use or threat of deadly physical force only while the apparent danger continues and it ends when the apparent danger ends. The force used may not be greater than reasonably necessary to defend against the apparent danger. The use of deadly physical force is justified if a reasonable person in the situation would have reasonably believed that immediate deadly physical danger appeared to be present. Actual danger is not necessary to justify the use of deadly physical force in self-defense. You must decide whether a reasonable person in a similar situation would believe that deadly physical force was immediately necessary to protect against another's use or threatened use of unlawful deadly physical force. You must measure the defendant's belief against what a reasonable person in the situation would have believed. A defendant has no duty to retreat before threatening or using deadly physical force in self-defense if the defendant, one, had a legal right to be in the place where the use or threatened deadly physical force in self-defense occurred and, two, was not engaged in an unlawful act at the time when the use or threatened deadly physical force in self-defense occurred. The state has the burden of proving beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant did not act with such justification. If the state fails to carry this burden, then you must find the defendant not guilty of the charge. 